Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Assalatu Wassalamu Ala Rasulullah Al Kareem. Today I'm going to talk about charity and sadaqah, and is it the answer to the problems that the Muslims are facing today? It's a, a topic which stirs somewhat kind of emotion amongst Muslims, and it's a sensitive topic for a lot of people to discuss. Automatically, people assume that if you're discussing this topic, somehow you're anti sadaqah or anti charity. There are correct perspectives to it. And there are incorrect perspectives to it, which has led to a situation where Muslims, whether they like it or not, or whether they admit it or not, they cannot see beyond this tunnel vision of doing charity and fundraising type activities to whatever the Muslims are suffering in any way whatsoever. And furthermore, in, as I will explain throughout the talk, it actually does have a long-term detrimental effect, maybe unintended. And bear in mind, this is not passing an individual judgment on those involved in these kind of activities. A lot of the people who dedicate their time to these activities do so sincerely for the sake of seeking the pleasure of Allah. This is not a judgment on any individual. It's an examination about the concepts of sadaqah and applying them to them to their correct context and then understanding how their gross misapplication has actually worsened and prolonged the suffering of the Muslims, rather than helping it, even if we weren't to be looking at it from a Sharia perspective. But the first thing we must all agree on as Muslim, Muslims is that what we determine and distinguish to be haq and batil, right and wrong, is not governed by our own feelings of what we consider to be right or wrong. Nor is it governed by our feelings or our desires in any way whatsoever. Because it may happen, as Allah says in the Quran, that it may happen that you hate something, but it's actually good for you. Or you, and it may happen that you like something, but it's bad for you. But Allah says, you know not, only Allah knows. So if that's the starting parameter, then we can detach personal feelings and desires and emotions away from the discussion and examine the subject by itself without allowing personal emotions to govern what's right or wrong. And furthermore, it's only natural that Muslims will disagree. In fact, Muslims have had disagreements and difference of opinion from the very early years of Islam. Even from the time of the Messenger وسلم, the Muslims had difference of opinion. And where differences of opinion is permitted, Muslims never had any bad or hard feelings against the other for having that opinion. And for your information, even Muslims have some really seriously dodgy beliefs, like some groups from the Mutazila or Jabriya or the Khawarij. Even then, the other Muslims address them intellectually with proofs and evidences rather than having this kind of antagonism and personal you know, uh, antagonism against the other. Because at the end of the day, we only discuss to seek the pleasure of Allah. And what we convey and what we propagate and what each of us holds, whatever it may be, we should do so in a pure manner in order to please Allah, not for any kind of egoism, not for trying to get one over the other. And if Muslims actually carried this mentality, you'd actually find it actually has a unifying effect, even if they were to go away with actually disagreeing. And that's if they followed, again, the basic principle. The basic principle that we restrict ourselves to whatever the messenger brought is. Allah said in the Quran, That whatever the messenger brought to you, take it. And whatever the messenger told you to abstain from or prohibited you from, abstain from it. Which means that whatever the messenger didn't bring you, don't take it. Because it's very simply a matter of Islam is a complete and perfect deen. As Allah says in, in, um, uh, in the Quran, He says, Al yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum, wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati wa raditu lakum al islam adina. That today I have perfected your deen for you, and, and my favor upon you, and I've chosen for you Islam as your deen. So if Islam is a complete and perfect deen, there is no reason for us not to restrict ourselves to that which the Messenger has brought to us. Again, fundamental and basic <coughs> concepts on which if Muslims started every discussion and every premise based upon this, again, it would solve a lot of problems. And furthermore, 
Even if the Muslims were to differ, again, reinforcing the same point, what does Allah say? If you differ amongst each other, فَإِن تَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَرُدُّهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ That, if you disagree or differ over anything, then refer it to Allah and His Messenger if you believe in Allah on the last day, and that is the best for you. If these are the accepted premises, which all Muslims have to accept, because the verses I have quoted are not subject to interpretation, nor open to difference of opinion in any way whatsoever, then in that case, we can proceed with the discussion and look at it purely from an evidential perspective with no room for disagreement on anything else. As you know, the last century has probably been the darkest century in our history. Yes, we've had some upsets in our history with the Mongol invasion, which was short-lived. We had the Crusader invasion, which occupied Palestine and the surrounding areas. But again, it was restricted to a certain locality and it was temporary. But what we have experienced in the past 100 years really is unprecedented in Islamic history. What we have seen in terms of the oppression, the atrocities, the bloodshed, the displacement of people, and we're talking about really hundreds of millions. It really is unprecedented in Islamic history. If we were to look from Burma to Bosnia, just over the last 20 or 30 years, we see what the Buddhists are doing right now in Burma, what the Christians did and in fact continue to do without media coverage, in Bosnia, where the Serbian Christians play a major role in running re their republic within Bosnia, where the Muslims, they build mosques in their backyards, they oppress them, they still carry out, sorry, not mosques, they build churches. They literally build churches in Muslim villages on their private property, right in the middle of them, as a means to impose their religion and to continue their humiliation <laughs> against the Muslims. It's ongoing. Just the Iraq 1991 and the 2003 invasion resulted in the millions of deaths. And it's no exaggeration. The UN's own figures showed that from 1991, just within that year, between 91 and 97, six years of sanctions alone led to the death of half a million children under the age of five due to the lack of basic medication. Really, if I was to give you statistics and figures, we could carry on. I can mention Afghanistan, Palestine um, since 1917, the Syrian civil war, which they've instigated recently, Kashmir, the plight of Muslims in India. Um, in fact, one thing which is common in relation to the suffering of Muslims in this century is that it revolves around external influence, Western intervention and Western colonialism. And a small fraction, and only a small fraction, has been a result of natural disasters. So there, were, so there was an earthquake in, uh, in Turkey, in Iran, or in Pakistan. There's a tsunami around Indonesia. But the amount of casualties and misery and suffering that these have caused are literally, literally a fraction of the suffering which the Muslims have endured at the hands of Western colonialism over the past century. And it's natural that the Muslims want to do something about it. Because in the hadith, Muhammad said that the Muslim ummah is like one body. The believers are in their affection and mercy and compassion for each other. They're like, like a body. And when one part of that body hurts or aches, the rest of the body also hurts and aches and goes to its rescue. Or, or feels it and reacts with sleepness and feverish. So it's only natural that the Muslims want to respond However, what we have seen in the last half a century or so is Muslims responding in only, in only one way in the majority of cases. And we saw Islamic charity organizations like Islamic Relief, Muslim Aid, Red Crescent, Muslim Hands, these being established. And it would be no exaggeration to say that these organizations and foundations were established in emulation of their Christian counterparts, even sharing the names. You have Christian Relief, and these are all their predecessors. They've been around for much longer. Christian Aid, you know, Red uh, Cross. I was going to say Red Crescent. Red Cross. So we find that indeed these organizations have indeed 
been set up in emulation of the Christians. And I'll explain why. Why did these, why did these organizations exist in the West? Why did they not exist in the Muslim countries prior to the last half a century, say? Why do they exist in the West? Well, in the West, they have a system called capitalism. Capitalism is a man-made system. And being man-made, naturally, it results in injustice. Remember, only Islam can deliver justice. In the abs absence of Islam, nothing can result except injustice. So the cr capitalism creates this injustice. And in this adjust injustice, it allows the wealth to accumulate in the hands of the few. Those become known as the capitalists. It allows the, everyone else to suffer. And in pure capitalism, there is no role for the state to help anyone out. Either survive, you contribute to the economic system and the economic services, or you don't deserve to eat, you don't deserve to live. So what you read about the Victorian times in novels such as Charles Dickens, Oliver Twist, or David Copperfield, or A Christmas Tale, which you'll more famously know as Scrooge. What you see, the recurring themes in this about oppression and poverty and the inequalities between society, between those who are filthy rich and, the, and everyone else who suffers, that is a true face of capitalism, which doesn't even get resolved today because that's the nature of capitalism. When Tony Blair was bragging that under the Labour government, the number of children living below the poverty line was just over a million. From an Islamic point of view, that's still a million too many. It was over a million. The, the amount of people living in fuel poverty because they can't afford to feed their, uh, uh, heat their houses. And we're still talking about these capitalist societies where this inequality and this gap. And by their own figures, they talk about the rich-poor gap having grown so many times um, uh, over so many years. So their system created this misery to which then these organizations arose to plug the gap. So remember, man-made system equals injustice and problems and therefore resulted in their, in their people who, driven by religion or by their compassion for humans, tried to plug the gaps because their system, their ideology and their way of life does not cater for. And bear in mind, that their concept of charity as well, which the Muslims emulated, spare change, should be an embarrassment. This concept of, you know, the question they ask here in the West when they want any money from you. Can you spare any change? You know, Sadaqah in Islam is giving from what you value, what, you, what is dear to you, not your coppers. You know, not a fiver or tenner, something that you can do without. And again, that Western concept of can you spare, which is what reflects their organizations, was their design to try, because on what basis can you get people in the West to contribute <laughs> or give money to charity? When you see these adverts, can you spare two pounds a month to help a child or to help a whale or to help a dog? Or It's the same kind of adverts, can you spare? This is a direct result of their system and their way of life which led to this reaction. Unfortunately, the Muslims when we adopted their way of life, or it was imposed upon us, when capitalism was imposed upon us, coupled with colonialism, colonialism being the foreign policy of capitalism, we found that we endured the same problems. And we endured worse because they invaded us as they liked, they took our lands as they liked, they expelled us from our own homes as they liked, they carpet bombed us, droned us as they liked, so it was exacerbated. We talk about the problems that capitalism creates in the West. Our problems were a million times worse because not only was it the absence of Islam which caused these problems, it was colonialism which exacerbated it and made it a million times worse. So if we were to see that our solution comes from Islam, we, what the Muslims should have done is to look at what is the root cause of our problems, because this is unprecedented. In our 1300 year history, it's a fact. We have never ever suffered in the way we have in the past century. There's no debate about that. What is it about this suffering which makes it different? So rather than looking to see that it was the, what the root cause was, the root cause was the absence of Islam. 
Islam, when it's implemented, it eradicates poverty. It eradicates oppression. It defends the Muslims and their honor. It takes care of all its citizens. Even the non-Muslim citizens are guaranteed the basic necessities and the securities. And that's why non-Muslims preferred to live in the Islamic State rather than in Europe during what they call the medieval period here, while it was our golden period over there. But instead, the Muslims, they squandered their intellectual wealth and they sought their solutions from the West. But did it do anything to even alleviate it or make it better? Really, you know, I started doing some research and I never had time to complete it. Just to say, look at the number of massacres from when the British occupied Palestine, they disarmed the Palestinians, and the very first massacre that took place in 1948 by the Jews was in a village called uh, Deir Yassin. In Deir Yassin, the Jewish gangs, they surrounded this village, and, and from the 750 inhabitants, a third of them were massacred, killed, the women were dishonored, and they were expelled from their territories. And the people involved in them, like the Stern Gang, they, they included people who later on became their prime ministers, like Begin and Ben-Gurion and Yitzhak Shamir. They carried out a massacre. And then they cleansed this village in Jerusalem, Al-Quds, and then they repopulated it with Jews. And then they moved on to village by village and announcing to them the same thing. You will leave your village or we, you will meet the same fate. And really, just if you were to go through the atrocities and massacres, and we know about the major ones like Sabra, you know, uh, Shatila and Sabra you know, um, uh, in um, southern Lebanon. We know about the massacres in Gaza and in Janine. There are many others which we probably don't know about because we were too young or not born at the time. And if you were to draw a chart and a graph of these massacres you find it's a steeply forever rising curve. It's an exponential rise where the numbers seem to double. And that's just taking Palestine as a case example. And then if you were to draw a line underneath it of how much money has been raised in charity. And for your information, what we collect as individuals on the ground is only a fraction compared to what the governments pump in from Kuwait or Saudi or Qatar or the Emirates. They give billions. So it's not like our um, fraction of it, you know, even forms a major portion of that line. But if you put that line underneath, you found it completely did not help the situation in the slightest. And, you know, in some reports I was reading, until now, on average, three Palestinian kids are killed daily in Gaza alone. Daily. Three kids a day. And I can guarantee you some of these would have been in those Islamic relief photo shoots, smiling you know, as part of their PR campaign, would have to be. You're killing three children a day. You're carrying out all this, you know, aid work you know, on the ground there. But they're all being picked off. And it's not rocket science to know that to get killed or to get dishonored or raped on an empty stomach is no different to a full stomach. It's as simple as that. And then if you were to add on the Iraq invasion of just 2003, their own figures, more than one million deaths. One million. It's a mind-numbing figure. The civil war that they've created through their divide and rule policies right now in Iraq and in Syria, in pitting Sunni and Shia against each other. And the people who are dying on the ground aren't the Alawis, believe me. People who are dying on the ground are Muslims on all sides. Whether we like it or not, it's a fact. Again, what are the figures that are they saying in the past three years? Hundreds of thousands? Over 100,000? 200,000? They just become numbers. We've become numb to them. And again, these are just some examples of some of the um, uh, incidents that we know about. We haven't included Central African Republic, where right now the Muslims are being ethnically cleansed and butchered, again, village by village. You know, they're being burnt alive, they're being, being eaten, their mosques are being demolished. If you were to add that to this graph, what do you think it does to that graph? I was hoping somebody would have done the research for this and provided a graph which I can just copy and paste. But I think the raw data is out there. The raw data is out there. Somebody needs to accumulate that data, put it in a spreadsheet, and make a graph. And you'll see 
The situation doesn't improve regardless of the effort. So you'd think the time you know, has to come for Muslims to step back and say, look, there's an expression which says, if it's, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Something's clearly not working. And I know some brothers have mentioned to me at the universities where they go to khutbah, some khatibs who have been carrying out fundraising year after year, they just have to submit and say, look, how much more fundraising can we do? It's all we do every year. Nothing ever changes. So deep down, the Muslims have to be feeling despair. They have to know that there's something, has, some, there's something not right. And that can't certainly be not the solution. And while they're involved in these activities, new wounds are opening up in the Ummah's body constantly. So there is no relief. There is no relief whatsoever. That's a fact. You know, there's a difference between doing an action which is the right action. Doing an action which Allah ordered you to do. And then there's doing an action to satisfy your guilt, your emotion, your feeling, to make you feel, I've done something. But remember as a Muslim, remember the verse I quoted earlier. It may happen you like something which is bad for you, or you hate something which is good for you. You don't know. We don't do things just to satisfy our own feeling. Our own self to think, okay, I've done something. And believe me that the majority of people who do put money in buckets or go to charity dinners and car washes and stuff, they become tranquilized. Where the word tranquil comes from. They become tranquilized in believing they've done their part. They've played their role so they can go back to living their everyday life, go back to their nine to five routine, running their business, competing in their rat race and whatever else they're doing in their life. Believe me, isn't that prolonging it? Doesn't this add to the Muslims' ummah's sense of lack of urgency? Their numbness in believing they've done their thing, then they return to their life rather than doing the right thing. So, first, let's look at what is sadaqah in Islam. You know, the word sadaqah comes from the word sidq. Sidq, you know, like as in truth. And sadaqah is an ibadat. Let me explain to you what I mean by ibadat. You know, the rules of Islam were classified by scholars and they were just classified just to categorize them to say these rules belong in this category. They weren't inventing anything, they were just collecting and grouping them. So they said these rules, for example, are ibadat or these rules are mu'amalat. And what they meant was from the ibadat, ibadat are those actions which the Muslims individually carry out in order to come nearer to Allah. So when you do your salah, that comes under ibadat. When you pay your zakah, it comes under ibadat. There's no other consideration. The only consideration is this is something you're doing in order to come nearer to Allah, to strengthen your link with Allah. It's only between you and Him. The consequence is irrelevant. For your information, the same applies to jihad. Jihad comes under ibadat. It's not transaction. It's not a mu'amalat. It's a personal worship. So sadaqah done in its correct context, which is, which is encouraged to be done, because there are many ayahs and hadith about it, which I'll quote shortly. But in what context is it done and how is it done? It's an individual action as is prayer. It's an individual action as is fasting. It's an individual action which is done by man, not for the result of the action, even whatever that result might be, is done in order to serve Allah. So when Allah says in the Quran, for example, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, anfiku min tayyibati ma kasabtum, wa mimma akhrajna lakum min al-ard. O you have believed, spend from the good things, i.e. the halal, which you have earned, and from that which we have produced for you from the earth. So Allah is encouraging you to spend, you know, from that which is halal. And the verse, or the hadith, there are many other verses. Um, but, and there are also many hadith as well. So where the Prophet ﷺ says, Sadaqah. Sadaqah, which is translated as a good deed. And we associate it normally with giving you know, money or giving you know, something to the poor. Prophet ﷺ said, Sadaqah is incumbent on every Muslim. They asked, O Prophet of Allah, what about the one who hasn't got anything to give? And the Messenger ﷺ replied, well, he should go and work, earn something. You know, so you can give it. And they said, what if despite that, he still has nothing to give? You might just be earning the bare minimum just to meet his necessities. He's got nothing left over. Then he said, he shall help the one who's distressed. 
you know, comfort the one who's in need. And he said, what if he can't do this? He said, then he should do good deeds and refrain from doing evil. Refrain from doing evil, and this will be his sadaqah. In another hadith, he says, one assists a man in riding his beast or in lifting his provisions to the back of the animal. This is sadaqah. And a good word at every step to one, which one takes in walking to Salah. That's also Sadaqah. Showing someone the way is also Sadaqah. So he's, do you, are you getting the picture? Sadaqah is a good deed that man does in order to come close to Allah. And the reason why I'm mentioning this, that the ibadat, the, those actions which are personal worship between man and Allah, they were never, and I stress never in the history of Islam, understood by anyone ever to be a solution to any problem, whether it was occupation, atrocity, massacre, invasion, poverty, they weren't. Those were nothing more than personal worships between man and Allah, in his relationship between man and Allah. Messenger Sallallahu said, removal of harmful obstacles from the road or the path is sadaqah. And every good deed is sadaqah. And when you meet your Muslim brother with a smile, that's sadaqah. So sadaqah is a good deed that each individual should do. And we encourage it. And no one says that it shouldn't be done because these are part of the voluntary acts by which you supplement your obli ob obligations, your faraid, in order to top up your reward, in order to please Allah. The key point I'm trying to make here, brothers, is that the goal of any ibadat is not to be a solution to any problem. And this has never been a subject of difference amongst the scholars in the history of Islam from any school of thought, Sunni or Shia for that matter. And what's occurred today is that this ibadat, and it doesn't just happen in Sadaqah, fast a day for Gaza. Fasting is an ibadat between you and Allah. When you're fasting a day for Gaza, what's that got to do with the problem of Gaza? The problem of Gaza is a specific problem Brothers, can we just open some windows in here? It's getting a bit warm. Good day, not for that. Oh, that is off. The problem can, is not solved by an ibadat. In the same way, du'a. Yes, we do make du'a for the ummah. But the du'a was not designed to be a solution to a problem. In the same way. When you are required to, you know feed yourself or to earn for your family you make dua to, to Allah to help you in seeking your provision to keep it halal and so on but whenever did that dua become the solution itself so everyone just stayed at home made dua and that's it no one went out and worked similarly with jihad even though the Muslims they make jihad and they did make uh, dua before they went to jihad but was that, did that become a substitute for the solutions to do with preparation, training, you know, fighting to the best of ability, strategy, tactics? No, because the ibadat remains an ibadat. It doesn't become a solution to the problems. Because of the decline in understanding of Muslims, where these basics are not being able to distinguish between ibadat and mu'amalat, ibadat being those worship between man and Allah, and the mu'amalat being those actions and transactions which contain the solutions by which man implements to solve his problems and the ummah implements to solve their problems, they became blurred. And we found that sadaqah, dua, fasting, these all became the solution and, not, and, and the actual solutions then further came in the form of emulating Western charity organizations and events in order to try to solve the problems of the Muslims. So if Muslims were to establish Islam complete in their life, would we have these problems? We'd have temporary setbacks, no doubt. But they'd be minimum, they'd be temporary, and the Islamic system would be there in order to solve them. Why? Because, remember, as a Muslim, we're required to submit to Allah completely and wholly, not partially. And to submit completely and wholly means to live according to Islam. And in the absence of the Islamic way of life and the Islamic state, it's a fact, 99% of these solutions I'm talking about just cannot be implemented. But like I said, any issue which the Muslims then will have will be temporary. 
the great famine of Arabia in the year 638 when Umar ibn al-Khattab was Khalif. It was a major famine. How was it addressed? Were there charity fundraising activities of any type whatsoever? No, Umar ibn al-Khattab in his capacity as head of state, he dealt with it by addressing the governors of Syria and of Iraq and of Egypt and getting supplies in at a governmental level. He used a state apparatus to import the supplies, to distribute the supplies for that rough year of 638. And Abdullah bin Jarrah, who was the uh, governor of Syria at the time, he replied to Omar in his capacity as the governor, <coughs> replying to the head of state, saying, I'm going to send you supplies of caravans, whereas when the first one enters Medina, the last one will be leaving Damascus. You see, a state response with state apparatus, state facilities, it cannot be matched in any way whatsoever by individuals or organizations, even if we were to set aside the discussion of the permissibility from Islam of these organizations. So Sadaqah in the correct context was really like this up until just this century. Muslims live according to Islam completely and comprehensively. Muslims implement Islam, which are the laws of Allah by which we solve our problems. And then where there is an individual, and I literally mean individuals, where there is an individual who's in need, where the state has missed out, by accident, of course, then the sadaqah is for those or from those who are near him, geographically near him, who know about him, like his neighbors or his relatives, to make sure they plug that tiny gap because the state is human, is dealing with hundreds and thousands and now millions of people. And it's possible that there might be someone somewhere who's been left, even though the state guarantees security and the basic necessities for every single citizen. Muslims and non-Muslims alike. However, there's a possibility that there may be an individual. So that's why we found that Sadaqah as being practiced in its correct context. It never spanned even outside the village, let alone these global, international, cross-country and cross-continental movements that we find today. In the correct application, it was restri restricted geographically. So... When we look at zakah, zakah is an obligatory sadaqah. And the verse of the Quran which actually talks about zakah actually uses the word sadaqah you know, as proof. So when the verse which says, Inna mas sadaqatu lil fuqara'i wal masakina wal amilina alayha wal mu'allafati kulubahum wa fir rikabi wal gharimina fi sabilillahi wa abn sabil which is telling you to whom the zakah is payable. And it says the sadaqah, i.e. the zakah, is for the poor, the needy, those who are collective, employed to collect the zakah, and for bringing hearts together, and for freeing captives, those in debt, and fi sabilillah, in the cause of Allah, i.e. jihad, and for the wayfarer, an obligation imposed by Allah. So zakah, which is an obligatory, and the reason why I'm going to talk about zakah and sadaqah is so you can see the link and the relationship. Zakah is obligatory sadaqah. Again, it's a worship, it's an ibadat. And we find that this to be performed, it, can, it must be, per be performed via the state. You know, only the state has the right to collect and distribute the zakah. For anyone else to collect and distribute, even with good intention, is actually a punishable action. You know, during the time of um, uh, Omar bin Abdul Aziz, sorry, uh, Uthman ibn Affan, when he was the third khalif, there was someone who took it upon himself with good intention. And he went around, collected zakah from a few people, and then, you know, gave it to people who, who, who qualified. It wasn't like, you know, he gave it to the wrong people. They met the, you know, the criteria of who it should go to. But he was punished. He was punished because he was performing the job of the state. Because it is very clear in the Quran where Allah is addressing the messenger saying, خُذْ مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ صَدَقَةً تُطَخِرُوهُمْ وَتُزَكِّيهِمْ بِهَا وَصَلِّي عَلَيْهِمْ 
take. Allah is addressing the messenger in his capacity as a head of state. He says, take from their wealth, you know, a charity or a sadaqah by which you purify them and cause them increase and invoke Allah's blessings upon them. This was directly addressing the messenger in his capacity as head of state. And there's been no difference of opinion about this for the past 1300 years, again, across any school of thought. And when, Umar, and when uh, Uthman ibn Affan, they punished the person who decided to take it upon himself, the people who paid the zakat to him, they were ordered to repay it because it didn't count. So these organizations or individuals who take it upon themselves to collect and distribute zakat, in any format, it is prohibited. And it's the opinion, I have a long list of scholars here, like Imam Saraksi, for example, in his book Al-Mabsud. He says, Al-Zakat is a divine right of Allah and is to be collected and distributed by the Khalif only. And whoever pays his zakat to anyone else as a collector of zakat, not appointed by the Khalif, it will not remove the burden of paying zakat from his neck. It's like he hasn't paid it. So anyone who gave zakat to the mosque, like zakat or fitr, or gave it to Islamic relief, so they can put it in their bucket and then they can deal with it as collectors. There's a card that count. I could quote to Imam Shafi, I've quotes from him. I'm conscious of time because I've still got quite a bit to do, but I can provide all these. Uh, Imam Ahmed, Ibn Hazm, uh, Ibn uh, al Abidin, Ibn Qudama, Imam Malik, Al Kahaji, I think he's Jafri School of Thought, Nawawi. Just to illustrate, there's no difference of opinion you know, uh, on these matters that the people who are entitled to collect it or can only collect it are those. And the verse which I quoted previously, which said, who, you know, who are those who are eligible, who are eligible to receive the cigar? Well, one of the category is what it says here as being the, uh, um, the al-amilina alayha. The amilin are those people who are employed. They are employed by the state to collect and distribute the zakat. These people who work for these organizations or foundations, who take a salary or expenses as part of their job, they're, they're earning a haram earning, even if their organization was halal to begin with, and they were, and they were allowed to collect zakat. Because there is no difference of opinion that who are the uh, amilin, they are those who are only appointed by the state. And it's punishable offense for anyone else to perform this activity. So, furthermore, you know, zakat is to prove it's an ibadat and worship. You know, in many ayahs in the Quran, Allah is ordering zakat. He mentions it together with a salah. Aqimus salah wa atu zakat. It's mentioned together because they're a worship with no difference. It's not because there are poor people and we need to look after them. Because when uh, Omar ibn uh, uh, Abdul Aziz, who was the fifth uh, righteous Khalifa, he's known as the fifth Khulafa Rashida, under his time, you know, the people who he had appointed as Amilin, they couldn't find anyone to pay zakat to. But did it mean the Muslims were exempt from paying zakat to the state and the state collecting it? No, that further proves the point that this is a worship, it's an ibadat, which man must do to please Allah, not because there might be poor people about, and he's doing his bit for charity, in the Western sense. So they'd continue to collect zakat, even though there were no people who were eligible for it. You know, zakat is not a tax. Some people say zakat is a tax. They talk about the Islamic economic system as zakat is a tax, and is a tax which is levied on the rich to distribute to the poor. You know, the state does have a right. There are taxes in Islam, like the jizya, which is imposed upon non-Muslim citizens. There's a haraj tax, known also as the land tax. 10% of the land's productive worth, whether the person was working or not, it needs to be paid as tax. And during times of emergency, the state has a right to impose emergency taxes on those who are rich to meet the needs of the people if it needs to. But zakah is always payable. Why is it always payable? Because it's an ibadah, ibadat, a, you know, an action which man must perform as part of his relationship with Allah. So if we accept that Islam is a complete and comprehensive deen, 
in line with the verse I quoted earlier. And there's no need to emulate the Christians or resort to the West to and import their solutions to solve our problems. We'll find that Muslims have no choice but to proceed according to Islam because this is what Allah commanded us, whether we liked it or not. We have to proceed according to only that with the, which the Messenger brought to us, whether we like it or not. So the problems that we face today, let's look at what the problems are, let's look at what the solution is. So for example, the atrocities and the massacre and the displacement and the siege and the starvation that the Muslims face, what was the Islamic solution to this? Which is compulsory. It's no excuse that there's no possibility or practicality of doing that now. It doesn't change the solution. What's the solution? Well, it's jihad. Let's look at history. When the Meccans, with their international coalition of the willing, they descended upon Medina, laid siege to it. The Muslims were <coughs> hungry. They were tying stones to their stomach to relieve the hunger. There was no fundraising activities, trying to get the rich to give to substitute the poor. Well, there was none of that. Because this was a state of war. There was a siege. And the Muslims, they dug a trench and they had their armed forces ready to resist it. It was part of the jihad effort. When the Mongols invaded Baghdad, they ransacked Baghdad. Again, if you look at the numbers of people that they butchered and killed and led and left a terrible situation of widows and orphans. Again, the Muslims did not allow that and become preoccupied with fundraising activities to deal with it. They raised an army and defeated the Mongols. Similarly with the Crusaders. When the Crusaders came carrying out their massacres, they butchered 70,000 men, women and children in Masjid Al-Aqsa alone. After telling them that whoever took sanctuary in Masjid Al-Aqsa, they will be safe. But instead, they went in there and they literally amputated, severed their hands and their feet and their heads. And they were boasting about how their horses were riding knee high in, in the blood of the infidels, i.e. the Muslims. And they've got these letters in their museums. I think it was Duke uh, Godfrey uh, who wrote that letter. And you can Google it. It's, not, uh, it's their history. It's not something which we've made up. But again, how did the Muslims respond? No doubt they made dua. No doubt there were individuals who helped other individuals in any way they could. Because you would, wouldn't you? If you're seeing a Muslim near you, in front of you, in need, you, you will help him. And, and there's no question or dispute about that. But did the Muslims en masse mobilize and organize anything else other than jihad to expel the occupation? Again, the answer is no. But what's more is that charity has been used as a cover to attack this solution of jihad. Jihad is a solution to occupation, aggression, massacres, you know, uh, and all that kind of um, uh, aggression. But they've even attacked that. How do they attack that as a solution? Using charity. The term fi sabilillah, which is used in the Quran 70 times, including the ayah which I mentioned <coughs> of the eight categories who are eligible for zakah, and one of them being for fi sabilillah. Fi sabilillah, which is mentioned 17 times in the Quran, it refers to jihad. It refers to fighting in the way of Allah, to make Islam dominant. How many times have you had a bucket waved in your face with the phrase fi sabilillah? What did that do to the minds of Muslims? It destroyed the actual solution towards which they should be working and substituted it and replaced it with a corruption of the term fi sabilillah, which the Muslim scholars unanimously agreed that in Sharia terms, fi sabilillah, when it's mentioned, only refers to jihad. And the only exception was one or two scholars who said it could also mean hajj, because there's a hadith which uses the word fi sabilillah for hajj. Other than that, it was not used anywhere else. It was always confined to this. Yet this term fi sabilillah on these telephone shows, these TV shows, these marathon fundraising activities, everyone's blasting this phrase. And in the process, knowingly or unknowingly, they're undermining and attacking Islam and the Islamic solution and jihad with good or bad intention. And like I said from the start, I'm not here to pass a judgment on any individual. I'm here to address the concept. And this is very important considering the consequence it has upon us. Has poverty solved by Islam? 
Poverty is a problem. But how's, how did Islam eradicate poverty? Through charity movements and organizations. Islam solved poverty through the Islamic economic system. The Islamic economic system is made up about, from the laws that Allah has revealed by which we distribute the wealth in a way amongst the people to make sure that there is no poverty. And poverty is man being deprived of the basics. Food, shelter, clothing, you could health care, education. The basics, necessities, are what are considered as essentials. The Islamic economic system ensured that the wealth on the planet is distributed in a way by which it prevents accumulation in the hands of the few, where this gap can occur. How does it do that? I mean, today is not the talk on the Islamic economic system. We probably will schedule one in more detail. But to give you some glimpses, the Islamic economic system, for example, prohibits hoarding. Hoarding, hoarding is when people have money, any amount. And the messenger cursed the individual who was hoarding just a single coin, a dirham or a dinar, and he had no intention of spending it. He was hoarding it, and it was found upon him when he died. And I don't know if he was asking for um, charity uh, in the meantime. But, you know, people have loads of money which they're not spending, they have no intention to spend, they don't invest, they don't pump it into the economy. You know, there's a load of money sitting out there which is not circulating. Islam ensures that the wealth is constantly circulating to keep the economic wheel from turning, to keep it turning, to make sure that the wealth reaches everyone. It prohibits hoarding. It also prohibits and prevents the accumulation of the wealth in the hands of the few. The Islamic economic system ensures that there isn't this huge imbalance. So, for example, when the verse was revealed about the spoils of um, um, that Jewish tribe, Khaybar. You know, when the Muslims captured Khaybar, Khaybar um, and, and they destroyed Khaybar for their treachery. They were a Jewish tribe, had a lot of wealth. And when the Messenger Sallam, in his capacity as head of state, took, you know, took this wealth, he then allowed, then... Uh, the verse was revealed, talking about you know, how it should be distributed. And I don't have the verse with me, but to paraphrase <laughs> it, it talked about giving it to the Mahajirin. Giving it to the Mahajirin in so that the wealth may not become concentrated in the hands of the few. Because the Ansar were already quite well off. But the Mahajirin, who had emigrated from Mecca with nothing, you know, they were quite poor. So to make sure there isn't this imbalance, because they're already quite rich. So the state has the right, through its wealth, to distribute the wealth, you know, in a way by to make sure that people have money. The more people, the more people, the more money that people have, if there's no hoarding, then what's it doing? When people are spending, it's boosting the economy. It's creating demand. It creates jobs. So the Islamic State <laughs> made sure that the economic wheel was constantly turning. Islam ensured that no land can be idle. So if some, you know, right now in this country, 80% of the arable land, land which is good agricultural land. It belongs to a handful of people, dukes and earls, from their historic you know, uh, rights granted by kings you know, from over hundreds of years ago. So when you have the Duke of you know, um, uh, uh, York and the Duke, uh, the Earl of uh, Aylesbury and all these different, uh, they all can own a huge amount of land. This land is exempt from tax. You know, under the Islamic State, any land which is arable, which you can grow agricultural products on, 10% of taxation of its productive potential is, is owed to the state. It means that the people who own this land, they have to work it, otherwise they have to pay money which they might not have. And the rule is that within three years, agricultural land which is not being used, the state has a right to confiscate it and hand it to somebody who will work it. Which again, ensures that all arable land, food is being produced, you know, there isn't a shortage of, you know, uh, essentials. And people aren't hogging this wealth in this way. This is just an insight. Another example, resources. Resources which at its root, like oil wells and gold mines, resources at their origin are not allowed to be in the hands of private ownership. The state owns these. You know, in this country, you have private water companies, gas, electricity, oil, British gas. All these companies in Islam wouldn't exist. They, 
individuals couldn't own these companies and make profit from them. All these resources would belong to the Ummah, administered by the state for the benefit of, of, uh, of the, uh, for the Ummah. So the Ummah could use the proceeds from exporting oil, for example, and use that money to regenerate deprived or poor areas of the Islamic State to give grants to people to set up businesses and earn livelihoods, to keep that wealth circulating. So when this Islamic economic system was in place, the solution to poverty was there. What we've experienced in the last century, our darkest century, we did not see it in the 1300 years before. Why? Because we were implementing the solutions to the problems that Allah had given us, not taking the solutions from the West and then wrapping it up with sadaqah by misapplying the evidences to do with sadaqah in terms of how it should be applied. So the method to implement all of these is, is the Islamic State. And had we not lost the Islamic State, would the Jews have dared, the Jews of all people, who are the lowliest people on earth, who Allah tells you in the Quran, they are cursed, shame is pitched over them, that Allah turned them into monkeys and pigs because they're killers of prophets and they're mushrikeen, they return to worshipping idols. Was it possible that three or four million of those could have subdued one and a half billion Muslims? Was it possible? Or that America would have dared to have invaded Iraq and Afghanistan the way it did? Or the Buddhists, these peace-loving people who don't even hurt animals, they'd be slaughtering and hacking to death Muslims and burning them as they are in Burma, or the Christians would be going on the rampage in the Central African Republic, Republic now, or the colonists would be stealing our resources and benefiting from them while our people starve. Would this all be happening? Muslims have to understand, these are all symptoms of a root cause. If we don't, as an ummah collectively, it's not good enough. Someone could say, well, you're doing it, your group's doing it. It's not. It's unfortunate only, our, only one group is doing it, or two groups are doing it. It's an obligation on every Muslim to be involved in this activity, because this is his deen and his obligation. And if he was involved in working towards a correct solution, rather than being detracted and distracted and forever preoccupied with one charity event after another, then maybe the Muslims would become unnumbed to what they think they should be doing and start participating because the solution can only come into existence when many joint hands join and the Muslims en masse come on board. And to finally, to, you know, to address these permanent charity organizations, you know there's a hadith in which the Messenger Sallallahu said, each one of you is a guardian and each one of you is questioned or accountable for his subjects. The Imam is responsible for the people and he will be questioned for this responsibility. The Imam be here being the head of state. And the man is responsible over the people of his household. And he will be accountable for them. And the woman is responsible for her husband's house and children. And she is accountable for them. And the, mas and the servant is a guardian over the wealth of his master. And he will be accounted for this. And each of you is a guardian. And each of you will be accounted for your responsibility. The context of this hadith has always been understood by the Muslims from the beginning that it's the duty of the head of state to be involved in implementing the solutions and looking after the affairs of the ummah in the short term and in the long term, not turning sadhakar into this activity. And again, this has not been differed upon all the different schools of thought. Just a few quotes. You know, Imam Qurafi, a 6th century scholar, you know, famous Maliki scholar, you know, he says, you know, in his book, Uwaid um, al-Farooq, whatever the Messenger Sallallahu did in his capacity as a leader of the state, it's not allowed for anyone to do that except by his permission, I, unless he's appointed them. Or what Imam Mawardi, a 5th century scholar, says in his book, Ahkam al-Sultaniya, although these are his obligations, i.e. The, the head of state, Islamically, it is a duty and right of any ruler in the position of Khilafa or Khalifa. Since the Messenger Sallallahu said, each one of you is responsible and each of you is responsible or accountable for his responsibilities. So these lost hadith, which Muslims take or just put to the side, they restrict the activities of Muslims 
of acting as a government department, as an institution. There's a big difference between you and all of us here, inshallah, have given sadaqah through to, uh, and zakah by delegation. Not, not where somebody's collecting with a bucket, where you, you've asked, do you know anyone who knows who, who's eligible for zakah? And they'll say, yeah, my relative there. Or someone might say, I've got family in Syria, or, you know, who know people there. You'll say, can you give this to my behalf? That's delegation. That's not doing the Khalif's job. That is something which we do and we're required to do. I'm talking about this concept of organize, organizing charity. This is something which is completely alien to Islam, not known in Islam for 1300 years, and is a direct emulation of the West. People might say, well, you can't really say that. Everyone knows what the real solution is. They're just doing this temporarily, short term, but they're not. I mean, I just went to a few websites like Islamic Relief, Muslim Hands, Red Crescent. I've got some quotes here. You tell me if they are responding to a one-off as an individual, you know, as an ibadat, or are they institutionalized and acting as a, as a state institution? Here's a quote. Islamic Relief strives to alleviate suffering, hunger, illiteracy, and diseases worldwide without regard to color, race, or creed, and to provide aid in a compassionate and dignified manner. You know, alleviate suffering and hungry. But that's the job of the Islamic economic system, not an organization. And the economic system is implemented by the Khalif, not by an individual or group through Sadaqa, which is an ibadat. Muslim aid endeavors to tackle the poverty and its causes. Well, colonialism is its causes. How are they tackling that? Well, that's completely false anyway. Our vision is to the alleviation of poverty and education for all and the provision of basic amenities for those in need in order to create a world where blah, blah, blah. Again, this is the job of the state. It's not the job of any uh, individual or organization. I mean, how many more of these do you need? Muslim hands, from addressing the short-term needs to tackling the long-term issues. These are far from one-off individual acts. The one-off individual act would be like this. You know, I know someone who's had a tragedy and there's, some, and there's a widow and there's some orphans left behind. And I contact all you guys say, brothers, there's a family in need. You know, so if you have any sadaqa or zakah, you know, uh, give it to me and I'll pass it on to them. That's completely different. Setting up an organization or a foundation which is involved in behaving like the state is completely haram and prohibited and never been the subject of discussion. And the proof is it's never existed for the past 1300 years. But people will say, yeah, we know that's the long term solution and this is the short term solution. Do they really understand what they're saying? Do our brothers who say this really understand what they're saying? What is a solution? A solution is something which solves a problem. And what the solution for a Muslim, from where must it come? Emulating the West from our own desires and whims? Or from the Hukum Shari? The, the, the solution which Allah has given to us that we should implement. So the long-term solution, which is called the long-term, in fact is the, is the solution. This is what Allah will ask you about. Somebody could be exhausting himself with the short-term, in inverted comma, <coughs> com, uh, quotes, um, you know, um, a solution. But is there any merit in this when you're neglecting the hukum of Allah, which is what he will account and punish you for on the day of judgment? And in reality, if they accepted that, unless we were to take that, even if they said, okay, the long-term solution, we accept it. That's the long-term solution. If they really believed it, then why are they not engaged in it? <coughs> not just by merely paying lip service say, yeah we support it, yeah, we agree with you and take comfort in the fact there's a handful of people doing it no, it's an obligation on all of us if I'm doing it, I'm doing it for myself so on the day of judgment I can say to Allah I did my best to perform my obligation to serve you to, in order to please him and to save myself from the hellfire no one else can take comfort in my actions they're <coughs> on the neck of everyone so if they really believe that was the long term solution why not perform it? Why not be engaged in it? So do they really believe it? Instead, we find really it's one campaign after another. One car wash, one dinner, one run, this. One after the other, one after the other. So do they really believe in this short term or long term when they're neglecting you know, the actual hukum of Allah on this matter? The other emotional one, you know, I hear quite a lot and I've been hearing it since I was a student in the 90s quite a lot. Well, what are we supposed to do in the meantime? I agree with you. That's the solution. But what's practical? Tell me something now. Is the hukum of Allah impractical? Has Allah asked us to do something which is beyond us? Even though he said he doesn't burden a soul with anything that it can't bear. 
I mean, really, if we understand what, what's being said here, we know that's what Allah commanded, but now give me something else to do. That's what's really being said. How's that possible for a Muslim? How's that possible for a Muslim when we've been told, take whatever the messenger brought you. Yeah, I agree, whatever the messenger brought is, that's what we should be doing. But in the meantime, give me something else to do. Can that really be, you know, something which is, uh, which can be said from Islam? And the answer is clearly not. Let's look at the messengers of Salam in Mecca. You know, people sometimes say, you all talk. You talk, where's action? No action. And they think by waving buckets around and holding dinners and things like this, they're doing something. We're all talk. It's meant to be a bit of a cheap sh- shot and a, uh, and a bit of a dig. But it doesn't matter because Allah said in the Quran that the messenger is Uswatan Hasana. He's in him is the best example. So for 13 years when he was in Mecca, there were orphans. He didn't work for an orphanage. They were oppressed and the hungry. He never had a charity camel wash. There were people who were living in dire straits. His own Muslims were being tortured. He walked past the family of Yasser and he could hear them. He could hear their screams as they were being tortured. There was no campaign to free Yasser and Samaya and have a whip round for them. There wasn't. He continued to call for his mission. What was his mission? To establish Islam. Because once you establish Islam, you solve all the injustices which are associated with the absence of Islam. He continued in a tunnel vision to work for it. And the only thing which he said to Sumeya, when before she was killed, was be steadfast, O family of Yasser. Jannah is yours. And she said, O prophet, I see it. Even she didn't say, what do you mean Jannah is mine? That's all talk. Do something. Talk is cheap. So next time someone says, this is cheap, and they have digs, remind them, you're actually insulting the messenger, because this is the way of the messenger. The way of the messenger, sallallahu is to establish Islam. You establish Islam, you solve all the problems associated with the absence of Islam. You neglect Islam, you get all the problems, and it doesn't get resolved. And had the messenger try to, for three years, you know the Muslims were starving for three years when they were being boycotted, in the, between the 10th and the 13th year. For three years they were starving. And when the Muslims were coming to him and showing him, lifting their shirt and showing that they had a stone tied to their stomach to quell the hunger pangs, he would lift his shirt and show too. Again, why was there no fundraising activity or charity campaign? Why did he continue to approach the Arab tribes and deliver his message, hoping that his message gets through so he can establish Islam. And through the establishment of Islam, all the other symptoms and injustices become solved. Why didn't he? Because he was commanded to solve the problems by establishing Islam. As Muslims, we've been ordered to emulate him. We don't have a choice in the matter. It's not a personal preference. Believe me, it'd be far easier to hold a charity event, put some money in there, and then get on with our lives, rather than through this grueling activity, day in and day out, in trying to get this message out, while the kuffar do everything they can to put the obstacles in the way, to derail us, even using other Muslims and organizations to obstruct us, and to derail us to stop this guessing message out, as if a victory for Islam would be a personal victory for us. It's not. We are nothing more than humble servants for Islam. If somebody thinks we don't have the right way or anything which we are proceeding according to is not the way of the messenger, we're only happy to take Nasir. If it means helping us and saving us from the fire and taking us to Jannah, why wouldn't we? But instead, we get this campaign and torrent as if it's a personal thing. Believe me, there's no personal ambitions here. There's no payments, there's no funding, there's no jobs. In fact, it's it's a distraction from all that. You won't be pursuing your careers or businesses or things that you might like to because you're occupied in the mission of the Messenger of Allah. However, the enemies and the people who they feel to throw this mission off its track, they do make it look like in a complete different light. And we need to continue <laughs> to work on this. So the conclusion is, Sadaka is not, there's nothing wrong with Sadaka, but we need to understand what it is as an ibadat, as a worship, the correct way of applying it, and we should give sadaqah. It's part of it in the same way that we make du'a, in the same way that we make salah. There's no d- dispute about that. But to organize and conduct it and to make it the solution, even if you don't c- proclaim it, 
but in actions while not working for the solution especially is something which Allah will really ask us about. And I invite all Muslims to work for this mission because this is not my mission. The mission to establish Islam has to be the mission of all Muslims because who does Islam belong to? We don't have a copyright over it. It belongs to the Muslims. So they should embrace this mission because it's a mission of the messenger. So we may then implement it, remove the injustices in the world caused by it and convey it to the rest of the mankind. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر فر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين فاستغفروه إنه هو هو الغفور الرحيم. And finally, I seek forgiveness from Allah for me and for you and for the rest of the Muslims. So ask for forgiveness. He is surely the one who forgives, the most merciful. Thanks for watching that video. For more exclusive videos, please like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget, you can listen to some of our shows wherever you are because we're also available on all popular podcast platforms. And for more Voice of the Ummah content, make sure you check out the links to all of our social media platforms in the description below.